because we don't understand how life formed. It is difficult to estimate this probability. The likelihood of a complex molecule like DNA being created by random collisions of atoms in a primordial ocean is fantastically small. In an infinite universe, it would happen in some places, but they would be very far apart. If we want to find advanced intelligent life, our best bet is to listen for radio signals. Look up to the stars and the forest that surround. Do you see them? Do you hear them? Are they there? SpacedOutRadio.com presents S4 with Forest Moon Paranormal's Eric Cooper and friends. Also, take the time to join the Forest Moon Paranormal Facebook group. Space travelers, it's time to go live on S4 with Eric Cooper. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to S4 with Eric Cooper, broadcasting live from the beautiful mountains of concrete, Washington. And now, without further ado, your host, Forest Moon Paranormal's own Eric Cooper. Hey, good evening, everyone, from the mountains of concrete, Washington, like uh, Corey said, and uh, good to have everyone here. Uh, I'm having technical difficulties on my end. I can't get into the chat room. I'm working on that as we're talking here, uh, but I'll be in there shortly. Um, so we had an awesome training, didn't we, uh, Corey, uh, Saturday with alien abduction and UFOs. Next month, it's going to be uh, alien races. It'll be the second. No, it'll be a. Uh, I just look at the group. It's uh, uh, it's, it's going to be on the, the 15th. Third time. Yeah, the 15th, yeah. Annie's Pizza, 2 o'clock. Um, and then, of course, we always have our parable copy the second Friday of the month. And let's see, other than that, there's not a whole lot going on. Now, we have done something for Paracon uh, on our website. If you want to be a sponsor, you have a business and you would like to be a sponsor, uh, go on our website and find the link uh, in the group. And or just get a hold of me, and all I need is a like one sentence tagline of what your business is, and a website link. 
and $30, and you can be a sponsor. So without further ado, we're going to have Seth Kinsey jump in, and tonight we're talking gin. It's going to be a very interesting show, because I know not much knowledge is out there about the gin. So take it away, Seth. Well, everybody, first of all, I have to say to my brothers in faith, Salam Alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And to all of you, may peace be upon you and God's blessings and mercy. Uh, You all know that there's a side of me. I like to laugh. I like to joke. I like to have fun. Um, I've always been interested in the paranormal and the unseen. uh, The haib, as we call it in Arabic. And um, I came upon a practice in Islam known as rokia or healing. And a lot of people don't really seem to think of, or the thought doesn't cross their mind, rather, that there is actually a form of battling the supernatural that Muslims partake in. Uh, There are some Muslims who agree with it. There are some who don't. There are some who have their own method that works. And there are others that have their own method that is ridiculous. I'm not going to badmouth anybody when it comes to that. I will let you look and see for yourself. Now, before we get started, it is my duty when we talk about this, especially during this month of Ramadan, uh, in educating you that I do say a prayer of protection. And I urge you all to do the same. I'm going to ahead of time, and I will also translate that from the Arabic into the English language. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to say the Arabic and then the English directly after. (laughs) Na'udhu billah minash shaitanir rajim. I seek refuge in God. From Satan the accursed. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, the name of God, the most gracious and most merciful. Allahu la ilaha illa hu al hayyur kayyum, la takuduhu sinatun wa la naum, la huma fi samawati wa ma fi al ar, man zalazi yashfarwinduhu illa bizni. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ إِدِيهِمْ وَمَا كَلْفَهُونَ وَلَا يُهِتُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ إِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءَ وَسِيَ كُرْسِيُهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا يَهُدُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَزِيزُ God, there is none worthy of praise but He, the ever living and sustainer. Whom all subsist. No slumber can seize him nor sleep. To him alone belongs what is whoever in the heavens and what is in the earth. There is none that can intercede with him except by his leave. He knows all that was before them and all that shall be after them. And they can grasp nothing of his knowledge except that which he may will. His throne, knowledge, and power encompasses the heavens and the earth. And the preservation of them both tires him not. And he alone is the most high and supreme. Now then, with that being said, I first want to let you guys and girls know that despite what you may see on TV, despite what you may see in the media, uh, for the most part, there are more peaceful Muslims than there aren't. And... Just the same as there are more peaceful Christians than there aren't, and more peaceful Jews than there aren't. And now, you'll listen to paranormal programs in which you'll have a shaman talking about Native American practices and healing. You'll have a Catholic priest talking about exorcism. Well, here's our take on it. So I'm going to give you a verse in English that I want to let you know ahead of time. And this is from... Surah 6, the cattle. I'm going to give it to you in English. I want you to think about this. Revile not those unto whom they pray beside God, 
lest they wrongfully revile God through ignorance. Thus unto every nation have we made their deeds seem fair. Then unto their Lord is their return, and he will advise them on what they used to do. So in lay terms, what that means in our belief is, if I believe differently than you, I'm not supposed to slam you about it. Because I'm supposed to have my faith be my strong suit. I'm not here to sell you my religion. I'm here to tell you how we battle the supernatural side of things. And so I'm going to start at the beginning. You know the Christian the Christian take on how Satan was born, so to speak. But they say he was a fallen angel. Now, from the Islamic perspective, that does not make sense because angels were created to do the will of God. And what set humans apart from angels is that we have free will. So if an angel has free will, then they really aren't forced into following God's orders. So they say, okay, where does Satan come from? Satan, his name in Arabic, before they started calling him Shaitan, was Iblis, and he was a jinn. He is a jinn. And his act, his disobedience against God, was actually considered by some to be the first sin. Um, Jinn, made of fire and air, humans made of clay and water. So as it goes, Iblis, which is now Shaitan, was in a high station with the angels. He was still a jinn. But he, he was good. He uh, he would pray right alongside the angels in formation. And then so one day God had created Adam and he had not yet breathed life into him. And he's inspecting the body and he's jealous of what he sees. So when Adam's living, God tells him, I want you to bow in respect, prostration, but it isn't a prostration the same as a prayer. It was more like bowing, like on stage. He says, I want you to bow in respect to Adam as he is my favorite creature. And he says, I'm not going to bow to him. And God says, I told you, Ithamatuka. Satan says, no. Kalanachayun mintu. I'm better than him. Why do I want to bow to him? Thus, there was that first sin. So as he didn't bow to him, God says, okay, this place, heaven, this is not a place for the prideful. This is not a place for the boastful. So I'm casting you out of here. Well, it's a little too late for Satan, but he says, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Okay, so I know you're serious. You're kicking me out, fine. But can can you grant me one last prayer? So in lay terms here, God says, yeah, sure, I'll grant you one last prayer. He says, can you give me respite until the day of judgment, until the last day? God says, yeah, sure, why not? Well then, what happens next is, directly after God grants him this prayer, and my headphones came undone, guys, one second. So, directly after God grants him this prayer, he says, Okay, well, I know you're not going to go back on your words, so here's what I'm going to do for you. Since you favor these humans more than you favor me, I'm going to make sure that I can do everything that I can do to make them sin. And in every path that they walk, I'm going to be there, I'm going to be behind them, I'm going to be to their right, and I'm going to be to their left. God says, okay. He says, fine, whatever, but anybody who follows you, anybody who goes along with your sin and corruption, they're going to have a very warm place to go to with you on that day of judgment. And so then we have the jinn. And the word jinn in Arabic is like to be hidden, to not be seen. And so with that being said, you cannot see a jinn in their true form. However, jinn are shapeshifters. 
you can see them in human form. You can see them. You ever hear, you know, well, of course you've heard it. You two are paranormal investigators and the listeners that are aware, you've heard the expression. You've seen something out the corner of your eye. Did you see that? I saw something out the corner of my eye. There's a shadow figure out the corner of my eye, right? Well, our belief is, is that is a djinn. And let's say you're in public, for example. And these questions I had asked my mentor, Shaheen, one by one. He's a direct personal student of Ben Halima. And I had asked him several questions about this because I was always fascinated by it. And he taught me all I know by the grace of God. And so some of these questions I posed to him, I'm going to tell you here. And I'm going to answer them the way they were answered for me. And may God forgive me if I'm in error. So I said, okay, can a jinn come in human form? He said, yes, absolutely, they can come in a human form. They can come in any form. They can shapeshift. They can be that annoying mosquito. Uh, their most common forms that they like to come in are snakes and dogs. But uh, they can come in human form. And this is where you'll see, he said, look at these on camera where you'll see the reptilian shapeshifters and things like that. Uh, it's very... Very similar with a gin, you'll see a facial feature move, you'll see a twitch, or maybe you'll see a part of their body kind of go invisible for a second. And he said, but the thing is, you'll know it's a gin once you lock eyes with them. They cannot look away from you until you look away. Because that means they failed in keeping themselves hidden. And they do, uh, they do play tricks. They shape shift in anything you can think of. Um, and so I had asked him one thing, as I was a new convert at the time to the faith. And again, like I said, I'm not trying to sell you the religion, but I was a new convert to the faith. And like any new convert, you have a lot of questions. And so I asked him. I said, "Okay, well, what about aliens? And what about tracking devices?" He said, well, I want you to think about what you're saying when you pray in the Arabic language. I said, what's that? He says, when you're repeating and you're bowing your head multiple times and you say, all praise be to God, Lord of the worlds. You're not just talking about earth, worlds, plural, different planes. And in that prayer, you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise to the Lord of the worlds. He says, we're recognizing something beyond ourselves. That includes the jinn. However, who's to say that there aren't aliens there? So he wasn't disproving it, per se. He said, however, if it were not an alien and it had to be a jinn, then that jinn is powerful enough that once they get inside you, they have the power of suggestion over you. They can make you think that you are actually in that ship, even if you're not. They can make you think that they're an alien. And that is their main goal. And when they put a physical tracking device in you, that can be an opening to the other side. Who's to say that isn't the case? The paranormal, by and large, is unknown. And we explain it as we understand it, and we try to, uh, we try to grasp it the way that we know how as humans. As such is the case, as people always say, well, why don't you prove these things by means of science? And not to disrespect the field of science, guys, but 50 years ago, we had science telling us that we should eat a spoon of sugar every day. Um, but the one thing that's never changed is that we do have a creator. You can call him or them what you will. But we have all been given the tool and the innate nature to be good and to protect ourselves from evil. If you take someone, for example, who's been on put on a private island, a deserted island, and they're given no idea and no influence of the outside world, if they see an animal that's trapped under a log, per se, do you two think that they're more likely to poke the animal with a stick and torture it, or do you think they're more likely to try to set the animal free? They're going to set it free. Naturally, 
naturally. Mm-hmm. And I'm, t- I'm talking about like a castaway type situation. Let's say this, you know, this person just happens to be, you know, dropped out of an airplane or whatever. They're on a deserted island. They have no knowledge of anything and they grow up and maybe they're, you know, raised kind of like Jungle Book type deal. They have that innate nature to want to be good. And so with that being said, there's something inside. It's like when people say, well, I hear myself. Like, if you look over at someone and you think, God, I really hate that person. He's a jerk. I wish I could, you know, rip his head off and yada, yada, yada. Those suggestions, when they kind of feel uncomfortable and you feel that little pinprick in your heart. Yes, we have free will and that's what sets us apart. But it's when that gin gets us to steer our free will in the direction that goes astray from our innate nature to be good. That is when that jinn has succeeded. So then, any way that they can succeed in making you do something, I got them. Any way that they can succeed in making you disbelieve in anything that is good-natured, that's where they got you. And again, I'm not trying to insult anybody, but I, you know, I would pick my mentor Shaheen's brain because I wanted to see at first I did not believe this and it took some time before I actually got to have a sit down talk with Ben Halima himself Um, but I would ask him things I said okay well I used to be a Christian for example and I had seen where they would use the holy water and they would invoke the name of Jesus, which in Islam, yes, we believe in Jesus, Prophet Isa, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. But I said, when they invoke the name of Jesus and all of a sudden this demon or this, you know, jinn would go away. He said, why is that? He said, well, you got him to invoke the name of Jesus. And some people really don't believe that Jesus is God. There's a reason for that. But for whatever reason, the Islamic view is once they get you to do or say anything that keeps you from believing, being on a straight path, they're gone. They've left. They got you. They've done their job. It doesn't mean that you're on the path to damnation. It's if they can trick you, if they can get you, it's like pitting your two younger cousins against each other to fight. Is basically what it is. Any little trick, any little stab they can get in there. Okay, now that being said, they're tricksters, we get it. And now I'm beating a dead horse on that. So, how am I going to protect myself? What am I going to do? Well, everybody has been given the tools. Everybody. Muslim or not, there are three main purposes to what we call rukya, which is healing and incantation of our holy Quran in order to keep evil away from us, which is the jinn. Now, there are three reasons. All rukya is the treatment and relief of people whose lives are stuck and who have been suffering for a very long time. Secondly, It's a protection for the Muslims who do believe. It's a protection for everybody, but for Muslims, see, notice the first part is it is to help everybody, not just Muslims. The second part is a protection for Muslims to not commit shirk. And we do this on ourselves by reciting over water. And what I want you guys and girls to do is get a bottle of water handy. I'm going to do something really cool by the grace of God later, if he wills, inshallah. Uh, It's a protection for us against shirk, and it is a way of strengthening our faith. Thirdly, it's a way of educating people on Islamic matters, which I'm educating you. Again, I'm not trying to sell it to you. There is no compulsion in religion. Now... You know that there are people who do things to try to cause you problems. Uh, I don't know how much you know about it, Corey, per se, but I really want both of you to weigh in on this. You've heard, like, of voodoo, for example, where maybe they'll take, uh, 
like cut a chunk out of your out of your military fatigues coop so that they can probably cause you some aches and pains or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. All right. Well, some of this is done with the help of the gin. So the the scenario here that was presented to me while I was learning all of this is let's say you go to a witch doctor, for example, like uh not necessarily pagan, but over where they practice, you know, with the bone through the nose and the whole nine yards. And you go to them and they say, well, I want to heal your aches and I want to heal your pains. But first, I want you to give me, I don't know, let me hold on to your wedding ring. Let me hold uh, this wristband that you wear every day. Once you've made a transaction with them. Their gin is there with them, and they can use that, just like a hunting dog, to sniff you out. And they can use that to get inside your head, and they can find out everything about you. Like, you can take one look in my face and see that I have a visual problem. But you don't know that I'm, for example, I'm using myself as an example. You don't know that I'm diabetic unless I tell you. And so let's say I went to this witch doctor and unbeknownst to, you know, him, I don't know what's going on. He says, okay, let me see your wedding ring. So I hand him my wedding ring. He says, his gin is communicating with the companion gin that I have. Everybody has a gin who follows them, and I'll explain that in a minute. And so he says, well, you have diabetes. You also have a speeding heart condition. And the minute he says that, I'm sunk in. It's kind of like with, uh, you guys remember Miss Cleo on TV, who they found out was a fraud, and Peter Popoff, right? You remember Miss Cleo and how they found out she was frauding? And it's like, they call these guys, and it's like, well, uh, I told them the day I was born, and I told them the year I was born, and wow, they told me how old I was. Well, some of these people use the gin as a means of selling crap to an elephant so to speak and they can take advantage of the people who are gullible and they can take advantage of the people who are unaware of what's going on and the whole mysticism of it all and that is where we come in because whether or not you are part of the faith we do not want to see evil attacking you The holy words that we were given, we feel, is a mercy to all of mankind, and it is not exclusive to our faith. (laughs) And so we fight this. Uh, You know, men have always known the phenomenon of the evil sorcery and possession. Now, only modern materialism rejects it in the name of science, trying to explain it all by psychological problems. But there are certain indicators in which, you know, for example, in Islam, uh, some of us believe that Morgellons disease, for example, is a symptom of gin possession because a doctor can't quite wrap their head around it. Uh, Certain superstitions, for example, might be an indicator. Um, It was told to me about a footballer over in the UK who, for example, before every game, he would kill a bunch of rabbits and he would kill the rabbits and he would cut their feet off. And the reason he would cut their feet off is he was making a sacrifice to the gin so that he uh, could gain their speed. And just the same as any animal that's strength, you may have like uh, a hunter go out and they might kill a lion and drink the lion's blood and spill some and leave it for the gin so that they can uh, they can have some of the lion's prowess and some of the lion's strength and things like that. And that's how they make these sacrifices. Um, so at the same time, some Muslims themselves and scholars have ignored this and they try to make a roundabout. No, gin really means this and gin really means that. For example, when a woman is pregnant, the fetus, because you can't see it in Arabic, is called a janine. Uh, It's hidden. 
And so we come in to protect people from this. And there are certain symptoms like uh, blockages in life. Let's say that every single thing you try to do in your life, everything, I'm talking about the cloud of doom following Charlie Brown wherever he goes. I'm not just talking that you've had a bad day. I'm talking that everything is just all around hopeless. Let's say, you know, you have that kid you haven't talked to in a couple years because of a stupid fight. Uh, maybe, maybe, a, and this might be a little interpersonal, for example, but maybe you're having a problem where all of a sudden you and your mate can't connect in the bedroom. Maybe you're having dreams about things you shouldn't be having dreams about. Maybe financially you can't explain why the bills are piling up more and more and more and just everything is happening to you. All these blockages and diseases and conditions that can't be understood, someone is sending – it isn't just jinn that are around you. Someone can actually send multiple jinn to you. I want to ask you both a question. You've heard of the phrase, if looks could kill, Yes. No, yeah. it's called the evil eye. The evil eye. Yep. Now, yep. now, now, I have to ask you to have either of you ever felt a physical sensation inside when someone's giving you that stink eye? Nope, I'm heavily shielded. You're heavily but yeah, shielded. Yeah, I'm heavily shielded, but but yeah, and I always have been since birth. Um, mm. But yeah, the evil eye is a, is simply a matter of someone projecting their energy into you. And when they're projecting that energy into you, they're also sending jinn your way. Mm -hmm. And they're coming to you. So more than one. Because you've heard of, for example, like the Irish myth that everybody has a leprechaun sitting on their shoulder who plays tricks. Kind of not far from what a jinn does. And when Satan had prayed to God, he had also prayed, he says... Okay, I want to challenge you. And God, you know, God knows he's going to win. He says, I want to challenge you. He said, okay. God says, okay, well, every time a human's born, another jinn is going to be born. That's the only way you're going to procreate, and that jinn's going to follow that human around. And uh, he says, okay, I want a little more. He says, I'm going to allow you to get inside the veins and inside the heads of this human. And all the while, Adam, the first human, is hearing this right after Satan wouldn't bow down. And Satan says, okay, well, I'm satisfied now. Adam says, so you're going to give him all this to go against humans after you just said that we're uh, basically your favorite creation. So what are you going to give us? He said, okay, fine. I'm going to let him send one jinn after you, but I'm going to send you two angels. You're going to have one on your left. You're going to have one on your right. And so whenever you see people bow down and pray, when you see the Muslims bow down and pray, one thing we do when we come up from those prayers is we look to our left, we look to our right, and we give a greeting. We give that greeting. We're greeting our angels. You'll see when the Muslims bow down in prayer, when they put their hands up and they say, God is the greatest, Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest, when they throw their hands up, they're telling their angels to get behind them in prayer. And that's exactly what you're doing, throwing their hands back. It's like telling the angels, get behind me, we're about to pray. So it's our belief that these two angels are with you, your guardian angels. Some people might call them a spirit guide. Now, mm -hmm. with this healing and the practice we do, it is the treatment and relief of people whose lives are stuck and have been suffering. Now, how is it done? There are forms of this that, let's say, you're not deep in, okay? I'm going to use the movie The Exorcist uh, for an example. At the beginning when the demon is just starting to play a little bit of tricks and stuff like that. That's at the stage where, if it's not quite yet in your dwelling, and this is more than just the one that's following you around. They're always going to follow you around. But misery loves company. Let's say you've got more coming after you for whatever reason. Someone just does not like you there. Sending them your way. Uh, you can protect your home not just by doing 
Rokia over the exits of your home, but maybe you have a crack in the floor. Maybe there is a little place in your window where a uh, little extra air gets in. Maybe the window doesn't shut all the way. Maybe the lining of your window, like there's rubber or something, for example, a little bit of that comes loose. Any hole in your home, any break in that barrier is an invitation to these gents. And they can get in there. But if you shield them out with the Rokia, it makes it very difficult for them. It's just the same. The first thing people are going to ask is how do they get in still? Well, there are things that you can do to invite them in. Uh, and we are all guilty of sinning or doing things that are of a negative nature. There's nobody who is entirely positive. If I have a bad day and I, you know happen to yell at the dog or get frustrated and maybe say something to the wife or kids that I shouldn't have. That's, you know, that's inviting them in also. So you really got to, that's one of the risks and protections. Now, generally, if you are treating someone in your family, if you are doing this practice, this rukia, this healing on your family, you're going to be okay because that's a duty that's led on you is to look after your family. And that's uh, religion or not. That's our nature to want to do that for the most part. We have those kids, that wife, that husband. We want to protect and we want to look after. Excuse me, I got a little bit of a sore throat here. But uh, it is when you actually start to do these protections on other people that it is a risk for yourself and so i want to urge all the listeners out there um this is more than just using like a ouija board or a ghost box you have to have a little bit of restraint well actually a lot of restraint if you don't know what you're doing this isn't something that i want to hear teenagers going and uh trying to recreate the movie The Craft. There are real serious implications and it can even it can even lead to your death if you're not careful. Um, one such story when I had interviewed Sheikh Ben Halim Abdurraf, who has come up with this method of Rokia based on Islamic teachings, the jinn catching, he said he was told to come to a jail. And in a jail, there was a man who was possessed by a jinn. And the jinn was inside him. And when he was talking to the man, the jinn was actually a good jinn. But their morals and our morals are not in the same place. Their understanding of it is just like when you have a toddler who tries to make you breakfast and you know, catches the toaster on fire and pours all the cereal on the floor just for a bowl of cereal. Well, a gin trying to be good is uh, kind of a roundabout clumsy way. There are good gin. Uh, and this gin happened to be a believing gin. And what had happened, why he possessed this man, is this man had went to a prostitute. He went to a prostitute to cheat on his wife. So as he is in the throes of passion, getting ready to cheat on his wife, this jinn says, I'm not going to let this happen. So he possesses this guy. He gets in his body and he starts choking the prostitute and almost kills her. But he didn't quite kill her. The jinn stopped before he killed her, but he did enough damage to her to say, look, you don't need to be trying to lead these men astray. And he got the guy in enough trouble where, look, you shouldn't be leading yourself astray from your wife and what was given to you, what was ordained for you to have, your partner. And uh, so Ben Halama got rid of the jinn, as the story goes. And so that comes to the method of catching a jinn. You've heard of in Arabic folklore and the Middle Eastern folklore, you've seen all the uh, cartoons and stuff like that. Like uh, Aladdin, for example, makes genies, which is a djinn. Makes it seem like, you know, a happy-go-lucky, you know, catch him and grant your every wish type deal. That's not the case. 
Now when Solomon was building his temples in Arabic, we say Suleiman, alayhi salam, may peace be upon him. He was so given Seth, power. Go ahead. I've got a question. So okay. you remember the TV show, um, Leave it to Genie? Yes. And, you know, some, some of those things. How come they made jinn, which are genies, same thing, out to be mm. all these harmless, cute little things? All right, I'll tell you, that's a very good question. There's two sides to every coin, so I'm going to explain two sides. That's a good question. On the first side, the first side is the most, the easy, not the easiest answer, but here you go. The first side to this coin, I'm going to say the heads of this coin is, you may have people who aren't educated enough in this that they just see the folklore. They see the folklore and they roll with it to write a creative story, just the same as Bewitched, uh, where it only, you know, she would twinkle her nose and something would happen. And, well, with the case of I Dream of Genie, there's actually a lot of lore behind that, and I'm going to get into hybridization of gin after this. Um, the alternative motive in this is that if you make this appealing to people, and then it's going to make them think, well, God, I wish I had a genie like that at home, a, a Stepford wife who would grant every wish. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, what man wouldn't want that type of submissive, do everything wife? Uh, and so you could get that out of a gin. There are actually humans who do have relationships with gin, and they actually have hybridized children in the world of the unseen. They say, well, how's this happen? How's this happen? Well, you know the story I just told you where the man was possessed with a gin when he was choking out the prostitute. Well, if a gin happens to be in you, and this was explained to me by Sheikh bin Halama Abdurraf, if a gin happens to be in you and you are in possession of a gin while you are having sex and uh, you get off, then the next thing you know, if you impregnate a woman, she is also pregnant with the seed of that gin because the gin hijacked your body to uh, manipulate your DNA a little bit. And that theory is also how the RH negative factor was answered from a scientific and religious standpoint uh, because the gin have a serpent-like trait to them, which, you know, in Christianity, Satan was described as a serpent. It's not really that much different in Islam. There's several different kinds of jinn. And so just the same, if a woman happens to be possessed by a jinn and she gets pregnant, that hybridized jinn will still be there. And so you will have a human that is born where they are human, but they are also going to have another hybridized gin part on the other side. And so for it to be made a joke, for it to be made something funny, like there's a doll in Walmart, the magic talking gin. Um, there's a service you can call. There's an app you can download called Gin where you can get your groceries delivered to you and things like that. It's that instant gratification, and instant gratification is something we all desire and something that we all wish to have. It's, it's our innate it's, – it's, as much as it's our innate nature to be good, it's also in our nature to want things to come to us easily without struggle. And that's the promises of these jinn. They will, they will say that they can grant you anything. They will do anything uh, just like the Queen of Sheba. When her throne was brought to her quick, that was done by a jinn. And so it's made fair seeming to them. It's like the Quran says basically, whatever happens to you, you rot what your own hands do to you. So there is evil that others can do on you, which is the free will, which jinn have free will also. So I can punch you in the face, I can punch Corey in the face, fine. But what rots on what is wrought on me that my own hands possess is when you two jump me. That's my fault. Okay, I've got another question. Mm, go ahead. 
so you, you so you see genies on magic carpets. Mm. Where does the magic carpet fit in? The prayer. Is that what it is? The prayer. We pray. We pray on our uh, prayer mat, our salah mat, uh, and that's a very sacred thing. And not only that, but the jinn trying to manipulate the physical world. But the rug is actually rooted in the prayer. Uh, there's a story how Muhammad, one of the, one of the names of his nicknames, uh, may peace and blessings be upon him, is that they called him the father of the cat because he had always, you know, would be seen with a cat or a kitten. But as the story goes, he wasn't, you know, close to the mosque right then and there when he was going to pray. And his cat was sleeping on his prayer rug, his salah rug. And he didn't want to wake the cat up, so he actually cut he took a knife out and he cut around the cat to get his piece of the prayer rug so that he could still pray and not wake up the cat. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's something you don't hear on Fox News every day. But uh no. that's where it came from. And so okay. like you like maybe the B movie from maybe the mid to late nineties, the Wishmaster. That was with the jinn, and he would possess somebody, and they would, they're would they always into trickery. They will tell you, okay, well, you wish for a million dollars. You say, okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to say this in particular, but let's say you pledge allegiance to this evil being. And you say, in exchange for a million dollars, or maybe that, you know, if you're a woman and that, dreamy guy that you're looking after you want and he comes to you and that dreamy woman you're looking after she comes to you and the next thing you know okay well you got the million dollars and you got your dream crush or whatever well what so happens is your million dollars comes in the form as maybe you parked outside at the parking meter you get in your car and a bank robber has placed that million dollars in your trunk you're driving off and you get arrested that gin still gave you the million dollars and that transaction is complete or maybe you get that man or woman to come to you and you got them and the next thing you know you're in the throes of fashion. Fine. You get the clap. You still got them though. And so one of the one of the first rules is you really have to ground yourself. You have to protect yourself uh, before you do anything. And in order to have a catch, to catch a gen, they say, what is the purpose? You want to find out. Let's say... Let's say, Coop and Corey, you guys are just getting spiritually attacked. And you have the sincerest belief that it's a jinn. And you're going to come to someone like Shaheen. Um, I'm still learning. Uh, first, I have to say, it isn't the person who's doing the healing or the rokia. It isn't their power. Their knowledge helps, but it's not their power. It's the power of divine intervention. And the minute that someone goes to do this and they think, look, this is me doing this, that's when they're going to fail. That's when they're going to fail because they're boastful. And if they're being boastful and being prideful in that manner, then they're no different than Satan when he wouldn't bow to God. Hey, well, so, and that, and that, goes, go that, goes, with, that goes with any psychic that, uh, that overuses their, their abilities. Uh, mm-hmm. like we take it, away. and and that's why when on when on round table, when you know, the psychic question keeps coming up as to why why don't psychics give you the good versus the bad news? Uh, that that's one of Dave's questions. He always always asks, and uh, yeah, you know, you you get too boastful, you get too to where you charge too much money because you're you're making too much. It can mm-hmm. be taken away. Mm. So, you know, totally agree. Definitely. And it's like, okay, for example, well, for some for some of these services, and it isn't an investigation, but for some of these services, like Ben Halima, he travels worldwide, and he will go, and he will train people how to do this. Now, it's like, okay, I can vacuum my carpet, and I can shampoo my carpet. What if I don't feel like doing it and I want this guy? 
That's where he comes in. In lay terms, he comes in and shampoos the carpet because you don't want to do it. But he will show you, if you go on his website, you go to Google, you type in Sheikh Ben Halima Abderalf, uh, you will find his website. And the training on how to do this is absolutely free. He doesn't sell you a pitch. You know, I've been in this training and I've studied it. It's a little harder for me to grasp completely because my visual issues and reading the Arabic and learning all of the tools uh, I still am learning I hope to one day be on the list as one of his healers but the thing is is the training is right there he will tell you everything that I'm telling you right now and it's there for you to study there's nothing hidden it's not going to say for the phenomenal fee of two hundred dollars I'm going to teach you how to trap a gin. No, everything is right there. And if you feel that you have a gin possession, you can even request a remote catching. They say, well, how can they do remote catching? Well, here's the answer. Hold hold on, real real, real quick, Seth. We got a question from uh, our listeners. Would a gin infect a pork eating Jew with a curse or Morgellons, as he stated? Would a gin infect a pork eating Jew or Morgellons? Well, yeah. it depends. Do they have anything to gain from it? If a jinn has something to gain from leading you astray, they will. If they don't have something to gain from leading you astray, they won't bother. I'm going to let you in on something. I had a lapse of faith. You know this personally. And again, I'm not going to I'm not going to try to sell you the faith. But I am going to tell you my testimony. I had a lapse of faith. And while I did have a lapse of faith, uh, I was abusing my body. I wasn't adhering to taking care of myself the way I should have. And I ended up paying for it. Now, it's like Shaheen said when I talked with him. I says, I've been doing all this. He says, you know, you're not told not to eat pork because it's a sin. It's not because it's a sin. Now, raping someone, that's a kin sin killing someone that's a sin slapping someone upside the head that's a sin eating pork that's a mistake now you can take that as you will but the question that i was asked i have to give an answer that fits it so that being said that's a rule and the reason why it's said is because it's one of the animals that will eat their young they have a poor digestive system yeah, they do taste good. While I while I was non-practicing, I did adhere to it, and now I don't eat it. And people say that's hypocritical. No, it's, you know, you practice what you practice. I'm sure there's certain things, for example, that uh, like Lent. Let's say during Lent, people give up smoking a cigarette or maybe having uh, their favorite ice cream. I know there's a difference between that, but, you know, right after Lent, you go back to doing that. No. I have a roundabout question that I'm going to ask you. Uh, Corey, I don't know your religion, uh, but I'm going to ask you also. But whether or not you are religious, let's assume that you both are. I know, I know Coop, that you are pagan. Uh, mm-hmm. Are there any practices as a pagan that if you decided to give it up tomorrow that you would not necessarily do? ever again is there anything that you do that you do this and you say i do this because i am rooted in my faith and this is what i do that helps my faith and the same with you Corey. i I have to say it'd be honoring the sabbaths uh the seasons basically Mm -hmm. i really don't have one all right Well, then let me ask you guys what it means to do something religiously, as we are creatures of habit. What does it mean to, and I'm not talking about faith-based, I'm asking both of you, what does it mean to do something religiously? Because this leads into what, more of the answer. Well, for Christians, it's usually going to a church somewhere, you know, using the building to say, oh, this is what you have to do to be in God's presence, which if you actually read the Bible itself, it says that any where three or more gathered my name is, is church. So 
Exactly. So you know, it's but that's that's a religious thing. The the mm. religious thing is going to that building, is that has to be, you know, the house mm. of God according to it. So. Mm. Now, what about you, Coop? What do you think? Uh, to do something religiously. Yeah. There's ritual, and then there's to do something religiously. So give me. Well, by by now. Def- by definition, I'd say do something religiously is to have a routine, to have a set standard or a set routine that you do every day. Mm-hmm. It's both. It's both. Mm-hmm. Both of your answers is nail on the head. And the reason I say this is this further answers the question of whoever that was. And I want you guys to think for a minute about Mr. Rogers. When he would be singing a song, he would walk in the door. He would be singing to you while he's walking in the door. And you would know what to expect every time there's a new episode. He's going to take that sweater off. He's going to put a new sweater on. He's going to sit down. He's going to take his work shoes off. And he's going to put his play shoes on. And then he's going to go into his monologue. That's something that he was doing religiously. Something that you could expect every episode. That was the routine that was done religiously and ritualistically. Now, with that being said... This Jew, uh, because I know the conversion process to Judaism uh, differs a little bit. I know you kind of have to be, uh, and this is if you're following the organized aspect of it. Now, I have several answers here, because this just kind of opened up a can of worms as the expression goes. Um, (laughs) Now, was this person born a Jew, or was this person converted and accepted into the organized faith of Judaism? Because just because this person is born a Jew, it does not mean that they have to practice as one. Now, like, it's our belief, for example, that everyone, you got to understand what the word Muslim means. It's not like saying, okay, pastafarian. The word Muslim in Arabic is, you know, submission to you know, the greater good, which we call Allah, God, which it isn't a different name for a different God. It's like Coop when we had our private talk. Uh, some of these mm-hmm. places will have a sign that says God, not Allah. You're saying God, mm-hmm. not God, because in Arabic, the name of Allah is, it means the God. And the reason right. why, and like when you're talking about Lord or God in general in Arabic, it's Allah, like my God, my Lord, Illa, uh, like you say, okay, like uh, Bumblefoot, for example, the word God itself can be played upon. Like they say, well, the God of rock and roll, uh, the God, the guitar God, uh, the God of video games, the God of wrestling, this and that. Well, that exclusive name is respect for God, Allah, the God in If you look in an Arabic Christian Bible, you're not going to see the name God. You are going to see the name Allah. And with that being said, we believe that everybody is born as someone who submits to the will of the greater good. And someone says, well, what if I don't follow the Quran? What if I don't do this? What if I don't do that? Okay, there is an organized Part of this, and I'm going to point out two things. They have the Sunnis and the Shias, and what ha- they happened basically after Muhammad died. The Sunnis uh, followed Abu Bakr, and the Shias followed Ali, which was his cousin and son-in-law. And that's where their different practices came from, is because they didn't agree with who should lead the Islamic nation, or the Ummah as it was called, when Muhammad died. But there should be no sects. And some of the Muslims who might listen to this, they might get their underwear in a wad. But then I'm going to have to remind them. The Quran says, hold tight to the rope of God and be you not divided. That also goes along with the verse that they forget that I read at the beginning of the program. It says you're not supposed to basically uh, chastise them for believing the way that they believe you go your way you let them go theirs you walk about the land like you're a stranger now with that being said the long and the short of it is a jinn is going to do anything they can do to you to get you to sin 
That's whether or not it has religious implications. Jinn will even go after atheists. Jinn will go after people who are Satanists. They'll help you. If you want to be a good Satanist, a jinn will help you. And I'm not talking about a Satanist in the, like, Timothy Leary. I'm talking about, uh, not Timothy Leary, uh, Anton LaVey. It's been a long day, but, um, <laughs> like, the people, uh-huh. there was this one website I've been on, and they were talking about, you need to sit your family in a circle and defecate on a plate and let them eat of it because that's the flesh of Satan and some stuff like that. And that's not the Satanism that is talked about in the world of the paranormal. Uh, But that being said, anything wicked that they can get you to do. Now, you want to find out who's doing this. I've told you where they came from. I've told you what they are. I've told you what they can do. Now I'm going to tell you how you deal with them. I myself and every every Muslim who knows this practice, and even even non-Muslims, you have the power to fight these things. If you eliminate every negative objective from your life, that is your main defense. No matter how mad you get at your wife or your husband or whatever, you don't go to bed angry. You say, I love you. You remember that that's your mate for a reason, and that out of all the people, you know, you chose one another. You don't go to bed angry. doesn't mean, you know, tomorrow you don't discuss things, but you don't go to bed angry. There's certain things you do to protect yourself. You know, you always, you know, hug your kids a little tighter. Tell them you love them. Tell people how much they mean to you. Um, well, you, that's, you, you know, go ahead. You, you go to bed angry, that's leaving an open negativity channel, basically. That's inviting the negative entities in. Exactly. Now, I exactly. do have a question for you. Go ahead. So, can Jin occupy a vessel, much like demons do? Like, uh, when I was in Iraq, there were stories about soldiers that would go into villages uh, on their on their missions and find artifacts. They would bring mm-hmm. them home back to America. Then they would be possessed, or they'd be haunted, or they would be, you know, so on and so forth. Can jinn occupy vessels like humans do? For example, like a statue of a demon? Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, an artifact. Um, their presence can be tied to it because of what we call shirk. Now, I want to lay you guys out a scenario. Both of you right now are in a third world country, and I'm a millionaire. But I'm an anonymous millionaire. However, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm paying for your education so that you can be a doctor and come over to the U.S. or Canada and practice. But I'm paying for your education. You don't know my name. Well, you know my name, but you don't know what I look like. Well, let's say you are so dirt poor that all you can find in the house to pray to is a little dead cockroach. You take that little dead cockroach and you put it on a table and you light your candles about it. And you're praying to that cockroach and you're saying, well, thank you, Seth, for all the money that you're sending me to put me through my education so that I can feed my family and buy my wife that nice house. Well, see, the thing is, is any any of that goodwill that you're putting toward that cockroach, that's not going to reach me. However, that's going to send a negative energy to that dead little cockroach. And that dead little cockroach is going to be... The jinn are going to go to that like moths to a flame. Mm -hmm. And with that energy, with that negative energy, just like, uh, for example, Ed and Lorraine Warren and the Annabelle doll, uh, the jinn will travel to it like moths to a flame. And so, yes, that is very much possible. I mean, who's to say that there isn't a jinn sitting inside the thing? You know, uh, when it comes to our faith, God knows best. But the way that we understand it is the jinn go to those things like moths to a flame. 
Okay. And uh, one more question from uh, one of our listeners. Go ahead. Uh, are, they, are they physical or are they other dimensional? They are physical. They are on our plane. We just cannot see them. They eat with us. They go to the bathroom with us. They are in our house. They are sitting here with us right now. Uh, luckily for us, uh, the major jinns during the month of Ramadan, the shayateen, the worst of the jinns, are chained up. Uh, and it isn't really until this holy month, for example, that uh, you find out who you really are. Anything that you really do then and there is without the major influence. And so that's our reprieve in the four holy months that there are, just like in paganism, there's, you know, the four seasonal solstices and stuff like that. Uh, mm-hmm. In the four holy months that we have, you really, you get to try to connect with your faith a little more. Uh, and that leads to like the Ramadan only Muslims where some of them will just pray and fast and all that during the month of Ramadan. And then after that, they go back to, you know, just like how there's the Sunday only Catholics. Um, and I'm not saying that all are like that, but there's some like that in every bunch. Um, <sighs> one, one, more, one more question, too. Uh, so keep, are keep demons and jinn, are demons and jinn the same? Yes, they are. Okay. Yes, they are, because we do not believe that demons were fallen angels. We do not believe that Satan was a fallen angel. Jinn have free will. Angels do not have free will. Angels are there to do the work of God. They have to follow his commandments. They do not have the free will. And that is what made humans special. And that is what gives jinn the power to do what they do. Uh, Again, like I said, going back to the beginning of the story, when... Satan, who was then named Iblis, refused to bow in respect to Adam. That was considered the first sin, like in the history of forever. That was considered the first sin, the first uh, instance of disobeying God. And so the ones who followed him, the Shayateen, they, uh, they helped do the same bidding in the same way that the angels do the bidding for God. But then that poses the questions, where did the good jinn come from? Okay, well, there's jinn that follow every religion. Uh, there are some pagan jinn. There are Christian jinn. There are Buddhist jinn. There are Muslim jinn. Well, how did the Muslim jinn come about? Well, all the way up until from Adam all the way to Jesus. And yes, Fox News doesn't let you know that Muslims believe in Jesus. That's why after his name we say, Alayhi Salam, peace be upon him. Uh, we have a different belief than the Christians do regarding him. But that's horse of another feather. Uh, but all the way through to Jesus, the jinn were able to sit outside of heaven and listen to what God was saying. And they would kind of eavesdrop and try to get the upper hand in regards to getting in our way and making us do things. Well, in our belief system, Muhammad is the last and final prophet, the seal of the prophets, the heart and seal of the prophets. I mean, there would be no prophet after him. And the reason this is, is God says, that's it. Every time I've sent somebody to earth, you've said that they were a sorcerer. Or you basically said that they were nuts and you, uh, you know, I had to do all this different stuff, all these different miracles through them. And people still didn't believe it's like Moses and parting the Red Sea. And this is going to be, I know this leads to an announcement I have to give you guys. You said you are switching to S4 on Saturday nights, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's starting next week. Yes. Yeah, next week is, we're shifting to S4. Next week is Roundtable. And mm-hmm. we have Dave Scott, and I just got, uh, informed Everett Themer will be there waiting for confirmation from Eric Markle. Mm-hmm. So switch calendars to Saturdays for S4. Same uh, time, different day. Now, um, if you guys would give me a quick two minutes here, um, I mm-hmm. have to take, I have to take a reprieve for just a quick few minutes. If there's anything you want to talk about, 
I will unmute my microphone in just a moment. Okay. okay. I, I, I want to say something here. <clears throat> As we were getting really heavy into uh, talking about the gin, keeping in mind that everybody else in my house is asleep, there was mm -hmm. something walking around my house. You turn the EVP on? No, I, I don't have any of my equipment out here, but there was something walking around my house. And definitely got all the hair on my arms and back standing up for sure. <laughs> Don't know what it is. Can't see anything. Only on spaced out radio and S4. That's <laughs> it. Uh, you know, yeah. And it's just like, what's looking in your window tonight? Um, yeah, yeah, no kidding, right? We ain't, we ain't done that yet. Yeah. I mean, hell, I had aliens outside the house last night. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. But we're so shielded they couldn't even what we were. Yeah. Now, um, no, I, I'm kind of glad we're moving off to Saturdays because it, uh, at least then I don't have to get up, go to work the next day because uh, I didn't get yeah, the, the, I didn't get the particular it, nap that I'd like to have had before we went into this one tonight, and I've got to get up at six. <laughs> exactly, and for our listeners, that's why we're switching to Saturdays so that. Uh, we maybe more people will listen to the live show and they don't have to listen to archives because you can sleep in on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's, and, and yeah, Trippin saying, uh, trying to break out the equipment. Martin's been getting more visitors too. Well, if we don't get told about it, we can't help them out now, can we? It's just like, uh, we, we just had to help another, uh, spaced out radio, uh, member here a couple of days ago. But, yeah. I am back. Um, didn't want to interrupt if you still have anything you want to say. Oh, uh, when you get a moment, might want to have that astral team kind of take a look around my house. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a very creepy feeling. I don't think anyone's around. Hold on. Yeah, it can be I'll tomorrow. Sure That's fine. No, before, before I get into the method of the gin catching and what we do, uh, I'm going to take some more questions for probably the next 15 minutes if they want. And if there are no questions, then I'll get into the uh, the capture. Gin catch. Yep. Do we have any more listener questions? Or do you guys have any questions? Uh, I'm, not think, at the I'm thinking, actually, because I... Um, So, because I, I was, I was always under the impression that demons and jinn were two different entities, and that the jinn were far worse. No, there are uh, different levels of jinn. Just like in your demonology, there are right. certain lower demons, so to speak, and then there are the chiefs, and then their chiefs, and then their chiefs, and then there's middle management, and then there's Satan. Okay. Okay. So, so in you know lay terms for people who don't know exactly what I'm talking about, it's just like in the real world. Uh, you got your blue collar worker where their name's on the shirt. You got your middle class worker where their name's on their desk. And then you got your high class where their name's on the outside of the building. It's the same thing with the gin. Okay. Uh, and and now, now you're saying, you're, you're saying the gin, the gin are on our plane, but they're invisible. Are they shapeshifters or are they cloaking? How are they invisible? They are, are they invisible. They are invisible in their true form. Okay. They are invisible in their true form. To my knowledge, the only prophet to have seen them in their true form would be Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him, and Jesus when he was tempted in the desert, alayhi salam, peace and blessings be upon him. Um, but other than that, we cannot handle their true form. And the best way I can describe that is if you uh, have read the Stephen King book, It, where you've seen the movie. Uh, but more importantly, the description of what the deadlights are, 
uh, when they talk about the deadlights, it's we can't handle the true form. Uh, mm-hmm. But a gin can shapeshift. It's like I said, they can be that annoying mosquito. Uh, they can appear as a snake or a dog. They can appear, there are gin with wings, uh, kind of dragon looking, uh, and just all out grotesque. But like I said, they do take on human form. Like, you may see someone's doppelganger. Like, maybe uh, you might think that your wife was around the corner in a store, and it turns around, you know, that she's uh, she's two aisles up. Well, perhaps that gin is trying to get you to desire them and using your wife's form in order to do that. And you may not. It doesn't matter if you are aware or not. It doesn't matter if you are aware, uh, you know, what seasonings in the cooking. If they can get you to eat it, that's all that matters. Um, so that's the trickery. But the thing is, is you don't necessarily have to be aware to get in their clutches. So the gen can play tricks on you themselves. That's one thing. Then the other is if these blockages in life that I mentioned before, weird diseases, things that you can't explain, you got something going on with you, uh, you go to the emergency room and you're feeling crazy, but you're not having a panic attack, you know, Uh, but maybe they've taken your blood levels, they've done all your tests, your heart's beating fine, your vision's fine, you don't have any aches in your body at that particular time, and your blood levels are fine. And at the end of the day, you can't really think about why you went there to begin with. Some of these physical attacks are from people who say, you know, I think I'm going to send a gin after this person. And I had a brother on my friends list who just had a post. He had another uh, another Muslim woman who said, you know, is there such a thing as a love spell that I can use? Uh, is there a way to do this? He says, no, you don't want to do this. Because for one, why do you want to try to get someone to desire you who doesn't desire you to begin with? That's going to, uh, if you know this person and they don't feel for you in that way, trying to force them in that way has consequences. I mean, so as not to say, like, I mean, yeah, I persuaded my wife to get with me. I got lucky. I just didn't use the gin to do it. You know what I'm saying? Lightning don't strike in the same place twice. Um... But with that being said, when people are sending them after you in droves and they can intentionally or unintentionally send them after you, maybe you have that boss at work who's a jerk and they just, you know, block every promotion or, you know, the boss's kid makes more money than you and you've been there for 18, 19 years, Uh, things like that. They're sending these blockages after you and with every blockage comes a gin. And so that's where we come in. We will come out, and I'm learning still. So when I say we, it takes two people to perform a catch. Well, it takes one to perform an exorcism and any other. Why does it take two to perform a catch? All right, yeah, it may take one to perform an exorcism when a gin is already in somebody. But a catch is a completely different thing. So you suspect that there's a jinn in your home, and let's say, for example, Sheikh bin Halama Abdurraf shows up. He brings one of his catchers. Okay, well, what's a catcher? Catcher is someone who has been possessed. They know that they've been possessed. You know that they've been possessed. So I want you to think Ghostbusters for a minute. The catcher is the ghost trap, and the person performing the Rokia has the proton pack. And you both need each other. That's in the lay terms. Uh, So the method is, is they use an Arabic saying that says, whatever jinn are all around this person, all of you come, you know, by the will of the Lord, you come now. And so there may be one jinn inside somebody. There may be tens of thousands of jinns inside somebody. There was a lady who, uh, she was possessed by a jinn. She went to the... Uh, the ophthalmologist, and she was experiencing periods of blindness during certain times of the day, and she couldn't quite explain it. And one of these times of the day, she showed up to the doctor. She was experiencing blindness, and the doctor couldn't explain exactly why her eyes were uh, acting that way because she had come in. She had had 20-20 vision, and then uh, she had cloudiness in her eyes like she had had cataracts and this and that and whatnot. 
come to find out during a catching that she had a djinn inside of her who was blind. So whenever the djinn was taking control of her body, she couldn't see because the djinn itself was blind. So they can experience physical ailments the same as we do. Um, but you get a catcher there, and they're going to call all the djinn around into this person. And uh, Ben Halama has actually caught djinn by the grace of God that have actually been around since the time of the Sahaba, which were the companions of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, during these catches, when you have a jinn inside someone's body and that catcher has them, they have tricked the jinn because it's a jinn's nature to want to try to possess you. But if someone who is practicing rokia uh, understands the risk, understands the protections, and they are strong in their iman, which is their faith, for example, they always adhere to their pillars of the faith. Um, they are strong in their iman. So as not to say there may not be danger. There has been instances where they have stopped the capture when the person's body can't physically handle it, and it's like, okay, you know, you're going to retire as a champ while you're on top, and you're not going to, you're not going to be a catcher anymore. They get someone else. Uh, so in the three different times I spoke to Sheikh, uh, he had two different catchers, and two of them were used in two different, uh, two different catching sessions. And so he knew absolutely nothing of the Aoki Gahara Forest. Do you two know what that is? Yeah. Near Mount That's Fuji, Japan. Suicide yep. Forest. Okay, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. He knew absolutely <laughs> nothing of it. And uh, what's going on in this forest near Mount Fuji? Uh, and during the interview, we discussed this, and he did the gin capture about Mount Fuji. Um, you can capture gin from anywhere in the world. They can travel like light, and uh, you can find out what's going on, and then you can try to deal with the problem. So when he did this capture on the gin from Mount Fuji through his catcher, he called the jinn into his body, and he says, I want to know, you tell me, you know what evil is going on. You tell me why these people are committing suicide there. What are they doing? Why are they going? He said, well, the town would otherwise, where it is in the uh, Hokigahara Forest, the town would otherwise be a very poor town. But these people are making a lot of money on tourism. How are they making the money? Because people are curious about the forest. So what the jinn do is they influence people to go to that forest. And then that forest is so full of evil and so full of the manifestation of the jinn that you could take the happiest, you know, the happiest husband and wife couple. And uh, you can take them in there and all of a sudden they don't know why and, you know, Next thing you know, somebody's hanging from a tree. And it's kind of like a feeding system. They're drawing these people in there to do it. And all the while, this town is making money off the tourism. It's like, I want to go see this. I want to go check it out. I want to see what's going on there. And so then the question is, well, how is he able to question the djinn? How is he able to, you know, he's dancing over the fire, isn't he? You know, these djinn catchers are dancing over the fire. Well, yes and no. Yes, if you don't know what you're doing, and no, if you do know what you're doing. And also, yes, if you forget that it is not you, but it is your creator that is able to help you do this. And so, when you catch a djinn inside the catcher, and let's say I'm there and I have a catcher with me. I'm not the catcher. The catcher is one who is willingly being possessed at that time. Once the jinn has come into their body, they are now our prisoner because they are held in place, kind of like uh, the circle of salt for protection. You just imagine mm -hmm. that in human form, in a religious form. Uh, Allah is guarding you, but he's not going to guard you unless he wills it. And he's not going to will it unless you're trying to sincerely follow the straight path. A lot of people say, well, can I be a catcher and not be Muslim? Well, that's debatable, but I can tell you that um, 
Ben Hallam, I has said that th- these methods have been around long before Islam itself as we know it. So I'm going to leave it at that without being too controversial. So this jinn is now in the body of the catcher. They are now our slave. And on the astral plane, you might run into other beings, or in your dream, you might run into other beings. Yes, Coop? Corey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very possible, yeah. So now you think of, I want you to think of like Freddy Krueger. What is the way? What is the way in all the movies that they defeat him? What do they got to do to him to defeat him? It's been too long since I saw the movies. (laughs) I'll, I'll answer it if you guys don't have the answer, Coop. Nah, go ahead. They got to draw him into our world where he has no power. Mm-hmm. Well, they have power on the earth plane, didn't you just say that? Yeah, but once they're in a human body and they're trapped religiously, so to speak, then they are bound by our laws. Then they are bound by our physics. They're in a human body. But it's mm-hmm. also tenfold for them. If you cannot get a djinn to stop attacking you and to stop being evil, you can actually overpower and kill that djinn while it is in the human body without any harm to the human. How is this possible? Well, for one, when you are reciting holy scriptures over it, it is burning it. You are putting its feet over the flame and you are burning it. You are roasting it like a marshmallow right then and there. And uh, it's kind of like good cop, bad cop when they hold you, you know, they hold the light over your head and you're sweating. You're doing the same thing. You're interrogating that gin at a supernatural level. Who sent you? Okay, well, for example, there was a, a catch they did in a place called Huddersfield in England. And they were overlooking the city where this happens to be a spot where a lot of people who would go and they would do drugs and they would screw and all kinds of stuff. And a a place, you know, like that or like a brothel, for example, or something, that's a good hangout for the gin because it's for people who go and they kind of let go of their inhibitions, but they also have no moral restraints. So those types of places uh, you know, public bathrooms are prone to gin. Anywhere that's nasty, dirty, not kept clean is prone to have a high concentration of gin. But when this person has a gin inside their body, if you are my catcher and I am reciting holy verses over you and you are trying to still trick me or you are trying to still lead me astray, if I tap on your hand, if I take my hand and I tap on your hand, I've just cut off the jinn's hand. It's not going to be any harm to the human. I've cut off his hand. And then he keeps it up. I've still hurt him. I've still injured him. Fine. Well, I take and tap on his other hand. So now we've got a jinn that's missing two paws. Well, fine. He keeps going. He keeps going. He keeps going. I tap on the other foot as I'm reciting these holy verses. I'm trying to get him to go to the light. I'm trying to get him to, or her, or it. I'm trying to get them to... Uh, not be led astray not necessarily to convert to Islam because there's no compulsion in religion that's part of the Quran but to not be evil for that jinn is the main goal and to stop attacking the human to stop sending uh, the sorcery or evil energy or negative energy to the human is the main goal that's why you call all the jinn around like I said there could be tens of thousands in this person while this is going on and you'll see cases where, well, what's, what's, this, uh, what's this jinn doing inside of this human? And he says, well, okay, for example, every, every time Grandma farts, he beats the dog, you know, something like that. Uh, you know, trying to add a little humor to it here. But basically anything, let's say he's cruel. Let's say uh, purposely he's putting uh, jalapeno pepper extract on the toilet paper just for giggles. Uh, and then it could be a more serious thing. Maybe there's a gin inside someone that's causing him to uh, get drunk and beat his wife or to get drunk and beat his kids. Uh, serious things like that. That gin's in there and that gin will openly admit. Because that gin and openly admitting the sins that he's getting this person to do. It's also making that person look like a fool because then they're telling every little secret you got. They're telling everything on you. 
uh, everything uh, to make your flesh bear witness against you. And that is your protections is trying to be on a moral high ground, not to be arrogant about it, but to try to just be a generally good person. Because anything that you do that isn't on that level, that Jen's going to exploit that uh, when it has possessed somebody. But in the case of a catcher, it's a prisoner. And finally, if you can't get it to do uh, the bidding that you want it to do, you take and you tap that catcher right on the neck and you've just decapitated the gin and you've killed it. I have a interesting question here from the, uh, the chat room. And, okay. Uh, they said, uh, let me scroll back up here so I can see this. <laughs> are, are ISIS all possessed by gins? I will put it this way. For example... Isis is the name of another god, an Egyptian god, for example. And you cannot be a Muslim unless you believe in one god. You can even be a Muslim and not even know it. There's the religious organized aspect of it, which is the people, they go to a certain mosque and they pray. Or there's someone who, uh, like I said, the deserted island scenario. They're automatically... In that innate nature to be good. Now with ISIS for example. They may be possessed by jinns. Because they are trying to lead people astray. And make Islam and therefore other religions that believe in God look bad. Just the same as like you have the Westboro Baptist Church. And I'm not trying to be an apologist here. But I'm trying to make a point. If these people. uh, ISIS or ISIL whatever you call them. If they... Yes, the Daesh also, which is a dog. Here, okay, here, here, here's where I here's where I stand. You, to me, being pagan, you are disrespecting a goddess named Isis, which kind of mm. pisses me off. So every ever since they, you know, years ago started saying Isis is nice. I mean, we got mm. pagan shops that you know Isis books um, that were actually getting rocks thrown at and whatnot because you know the word Isis. You know what? ISIS has been around long before a terrorist group named Daesh came around. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that's what exactly. I... Exactly. 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 Yeah. That's a good point. But I will say this. They very well could be. And so as not to say that some of them aren't. I can't say that all of them are. I don't have the knowledge. Uh, when it comes to something like that, we say God knows best. You know, like they say, Father knows best. Well, God knows best. But I can tell you now, when it comes to these people, if they knew that dressing like a clown and wearing big shoes and red noses and green hair with bald spots and speaking in pig Latin, if they knew that that's what struck fair into the West then we would be having clown terrorists everywhere if you look at the if you look at the writing and i've had some of the writing on my profile and i will actually change my profile right now cuz i'm going to make a point and i'm going to do this right now on my facebook profile for those of you who have me on there the cover says on air i'm going to make a point right now for those of you who do not know the language I want you to, I am updating right now my profile picture. And there's no such thing as a wrong answer, but I know some of the listeners also have me on Facebook. You guys, are you on my profile right now? Uh, I'm not on it at the moment, but yeah. I I'm have going there now. I, I'm right. trying to, I got to stay up with the chat room here. No problem. All right, well, on my profile, for those of who, those of you who can see it, it looks like some very scary, some very weird writing. But that writing is the same writing that is our declaration of faith. And that is what makes me the most angry because our declaration of faith is something that we say at the end of every prayer. Um, it is something that we say when we first become a Muslim. But it looks scary, it looks freaky, and that's what's on their flags. And 
they used our revelation against us to create this. Uh, because in the revelations, which um, was passed down orally, not part of the Quran, some people believe in these, some people don't. But in these revelations, it says that once you see the black flags, you crawl on your belly to get there and aid them no matter what. But that is not what it means. It has nothing to do with ISIS, but they use that. It's just like if someone were to exploit the revelations of Christianity and try to be a causal engineer and cause things to happen that are actually happening in Revelations, like at CERN where another gin catching was. Uh, he did a gin catching at CERN, and he said if you notice these earthquakes and natural disasters that are happening every time they fire that particle collider, and uh, they're trying to open up black holes because they want to let Satan through himself. His influence is on the earth, but they're trying to let him through. And some of the most evil, evil, evil jinn that you can think of are roaming the earth. Uh, Satan's not quite here yet. He's here. His presence is here. His energy's here. But the minute he's here himself, that's when the sugar honey iced tea hits fan. But that scary writing that's on my profile, uh, we say, There is only one God and Muhammad is his final messenger. That's in English. And in Arabic, from right to left, it reads, "Hashadu an la ilaha illallah wa hashadu an abduhu Muhammad wa Rasulullah." And then some people will add Jesus after that, "Wa hashadu an Isa wa Rasulullah." And Jesus is also a messenger of God, which he is. Uh, but that being said, that's an exploitation. Um, these people, in order to belong to something, let's say, okay, on a baseball team, are you going to show up with a basketball and a tennis racket? Sure. No. No. In order to be on that baseball team, you got to have a bat. you got to have a ball. you got to have uh, the equipment to play baseball. It's like there's so many controversial things, and I'm not I'm not here to be an apologist. If anybody wants that information, I'll gladly talk about it in private. I'm not an apologist. Uh, personally, this is a vehicle for me that I feel works. But I had seen these catchings on camera, and the last catch that I saw frightened me so much that I uh, I shut my tablet straight off. I shut my tablet straight off, and I said, "That's it. That's." I saw, and it, it it could very well be engineered to look so. It's like the fake, uh, some of the fake UFO photographs and stuff like that versus the real ones. Some of the fake paranormal photographs versus the real ones. It would be the same thing could be said about if someone did a gin catching. And I can actually post a video of a fake gin. <laughs> um, and I can also post some of a real catch. One of the catches I posted myself, and it magically got deleted from YouTube. Good thing for me, I have it in my Google Drive. So, I will re-upload that. I will explain what's going on, because I know most of the listeners don't know Arabic. If any, maybe some of them do. Uh, but for those who do, they'll be able to understand the situation. But you can observe this physically. Uh, what was going on in this catching. But just the same, um, there's always going to be a gin around. There's always going to be evil around. And there's always people, uh, healers, rakis as they're called, who practice the rokia, who are there to help you heal from it. And if you don't know, if you don't have the knowledge of how to do it, if you are lost and don't know where to start, that information is there for free. And all the teaching and all the things that I have learned, and yes, most of it is from the Quran. It tells you what to do. If you look in the Bible, it tells you what to do. And you say, well, the Bible and the Quran contradict each other. No, the Bible does not, and I'm not trying to get any Christians angry. Christians are... <laughs> And a real Muslim, no, a real Muslim will tell you this. Christians and Jews 
our our brothers and sisters in faith. We call them Ale Kitab, the people of the book. The people of the book. And in the Quran, verse 262 says, Whoever believes and does righteous deeds and believes in the last day, they will have their reward with their Lord. There will be no fear on them, nor will they grieve. And it mentions the Jews and the Christians by name. Fox News won't tell you that either. No, but I uh, but uh, I, <laughs> I'm open for any more questions. We got 20 minutes and uh, you guys, you know, you're switching to Saturday nights. Uh, this is my last yeah. night with you guys until I get a Saturday night off or something like that. So right. let's let's, let's now, go now, big. I, I've got I've got a question for you though. So mm. why is there so much hatred towards Muslims? Fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown for one thing. And just like there's a lot of people who think that uh, you know they'll think the same thing about Christians. Uh, you know, some people have that view about the Jehovah Witnesses where, you know, they knock on your door, you're asleep, you know, it's Sunday and you just want to sleep in. I had a fella, uh, is actually my wife's uncle, uh, and he was big in the church, big, 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 big in the church uh, going and stuff. But he was so, I mean, the only thing like they were allowed to watch in their house was Little House on the Prairie. That was it on TV. And they were so big into it that it actually, you know, shied her away from religion. He was really pushy about it. He would knock on the door and things like that. And uh, he said, well, why don't you come to church? This and that. When I said, I don't go to church. Well, why not? He was pushy. I said, I'm not I'm not a Christian. He says, what are you then? He said, I'm a Muslim. And he started talking about stuff he didn't know. And I schooled him and he got quiet and didn't come back for a couple months. And then, you know, I had to tell him again, not interested. There's pushy people. There's pushy Muslims, pushy Christians. There's pushy pagans. I don't think there's any pushy atheists. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, there's yeah, pushy there, people. There, there's always there, someone there's more, to sell you their faith. There's more pushy atheists than you think. And <laughs> some, of the, some of the hate that comes onto it, some of the hate that comes onto it, I hate to say it, is brought on by some of the very people themselves. They're the people who will not speak out. They're the people who, and if you allow something in, within your ranks and you stay silent, then to me, you accept it. I am not silent. I have called people out on several occasions. Uh, I had a pretty large friends list group. You know, I had a lot of people, a lot of brothers on my list. That list thinned out to maybe about four or five who I actually have a high regard for. Uh, and they're there for a reason. That's because mm-hmm. I I have a trust in them that I can talk with them and they will give me a straight shot of an answer. And even though, you know, they're strong in their faith, they will still talk to me on the level that they will talk to me from their person, from their self, from their being. So you have people who will not speak out against it. But then I will say in Saudi Arabia, it's sad to say one of the five pillars I'm not going to be able to do, which is going to Mecca. Why will I not go to Mecca? Because the Saudi Arabian government, (laughs) Saudi Arabian government uh, has bastardized the religion. Hold on, yeah, okay, you pretty much just answered it. Uh, So Sharif got a question. So ISIS is not real Muslim. No. They are and not. actually Islam. Let, let me clarify, Shar. Muslim is the culture. Islam is the religion. A Muslim is someone who follows Christ- Islam, just like a Christian right. follows okay. Christianity. Okay. And uh, gotcha. uh, some of these, actually, most all of the people from ISIS, I can't say there's a genuinely good person from them. I really, I really can't. Not what they preach. Like, uh, the pre-Islamic Arab culture is, uh, for one thing, like, uh, the underage marriage and stuff like that. That's not cool. That's not cool. A lot of people say, no, a lot of Muslims, no. Uh, the Quran tells you 
uh, why are you practicing what your fathers practiced? Why are you practicing what your forefathers practiced? These, you know, these are the laws that I've given you. He's telling you, he says, you are not to inherit people against their will. You are not to inherit a spouse against their will at all. And you are not to ins- uh, inherit someone who is young mentally and physically at all. That is against it. And see, they use this culture just like the Westboro Baptist Church does, just like the Ku Klux mm. Klan. There's all this talk, right. you know, I, I, I have to say it. There's all this talk about ISIS, ISIS, ISIS. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan also is the elephant in the living room, which is the ISIS on our soil. And, and let me let me explain one other thing, because they're talking mm. about fear month earlier. Now, yes. if you have a white old man walk into a Planned Parenthood with a gun and shoot it up, it might hit the news for a minute. You take mm. a, a brown skin man, uh, the, a same brown skin man, same scenario, walk into a Planned Parenthood, it's a terrorist attack. Don't say mm-hmm. I'm not wrong. Mm-hmm. You're not wrong. It's fear mongering. That's exactly what it is. And it's. You, it's, uh, you know, and most of you know I'm taking Homeland Security in, in college right now, mm-hmm. getting an associate's degree. So I've taken terrorism classes. I've taken, and even my professors can't exactly show bias, but they're, uh, they're, on, they're on the same page we all are. This, this government is so corrupt and so twisted, and everybody knows that, that, I mean, within Homeland Security, that Muslims ain't the enemy. Religion is the enemy. It, it really is. Religion is control. Religion is fear-mongering. Every religion. Religious even extremism. Have Religious extremism. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's not, not even, it's not even really the religions themselves. Because, they're, you know, if you look at a lot of actual religions, most of them, uh, you know, you get away from that mainstream BS. You get to the little small churches and stuff, and none of them are like that. None of them are like that. It's it's when you get to the extreme end of extremism, like the Westboro Baptist Church, uh, mm-hmm. you get into some of these uh, ex- extremist uh, Muslims. Uh, you know the the these other white supremacist extremisms. It's all mm-hmm. the extremisms that are the problem. That's where the problem is. And they use religion to push their extremism. That's the problem. Exactly. Okay. And, Craig, and Craig wants to know what do you know. And I'm not really sure what you're referring to, Craig. Uh, uh, I don't keep up on news. I really try not to. Uh, what do you think about mm. all this crap with the tar and the horse and pony show? Don't pay attention to it. Honestly. I don't either, right? I will answer his question in this way. If I Mm want to know something that's going on in the world, I will ask a friend who is from that country. I'm not going to be friends with someone who's not a decent person. I will ask someone who's from that country. I had a friend who uh, I've lost contact with. I don't know why. Maybe he passed away or whatever. I don't know. But he actually lived in Iraq, and he was Kurdish. And I asked him, so, you know, what's going on over there with everything? And he said, well, actually, things are a lot worse for us now that Saddam Hussein is dead. He -hmm. said, and and, and the Kurds were some of the people that Saddam Hussein picked on. Uh, You know, some of the joke was, uh, why couldn't Saddam Hussein advance his war? He said, because he had Kurds in his way. Uh, You know, and all jokes aside, uh, some of the Kurdish were some of the people that Saddam really had a problem with. And, I mean, that's like, for example, a Jew in Nazi-era Germany saying, you know, things are worse without Hitler. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just like uh, a lot of these things, like Gaddafi, I think some of these people were taken out because, really, they wouldn't adhere to the Rothschild banking system. Uh, That's another another story. Um, But religiously... I'm going to tell you right now, it is the holy month of Ramadan. I don't know how close any of you are to a mosque. But I want to show you 
if you are struggling, and I know people are having financial burdens and financial stresses, if you are struggling and you are having problems, you go to that mosque and you go to that imam and you tell them, look, you know, I don't have groceries till the end of the week. You know, I just got sacked from my job. I'm having I'm having trouble. You go to that mosque. And the mosque that uh you know, helps you out. That's the people you want to hang with. That's the Muslims who you should be proud to know. Mm-hmm. Cuz that's For part part of, part of the faith. Part of the faith is mm-hmm. charity. And it's uh oh. What's that? I think we just lost Cooper. Oh boy. With ten minutes left on the clock, uh, That's while right. you're work while you're working on getting him back, uh, I'm gonna say that uh, you know we went from talking about the spiritual aspect of this, and you know people always ask about re- the religious aspect. It's kind of like you know if you see someone you know. And I'm not being mean or facetious when I say it, but like a burn victim. And you see someone with their scars in public and, you know, you're curious. Maybe a child will look around and they'll see something. And then the next thing you know, they'll say, well, what happened to you? What happened to your face, mister? There's there's these obvious questions that people are going to ask. I'm an open book. And I do have an answer for all of these questions. But aside from that, spiritually... If you need the type of help that Rokia offers, if you feel that you are suffering from any of these attacks, maybe you're lost. Maybe you've tried everything else that you can think of. Maybe you've even tried what you think should work and hasn't. Maybe it's just the last measure and you want to see if it'll work. You can seek out one of our healers. There are healers all around the globe. One of these days, I'm going to be on that list, if God wills, once my schooling and training is complete. But I can help direct you to the people who can get things done. Now, if you go to Google, guys and girls, and you type in, I'm going to tell you how to pronounce this, Sheikh. S-H-E-I-K-H Ben Halima H-L-I-M-A Abderalf That's a French name A-B-D-E-R-R A-O-U-F-F You type him in His website's going to come up And it's going to be in French by default However, you'll see different world flags You scroll over to the UK flag And you'll be directed to the English language version of the website you will find on the website his healers list. You will find on the website. Uh, I gave you guys the abridged version, the Cliff's Notes. You will find on the website in more detail everything that I've told you. You will also, if you go on YouTube and you type in his name or you type in Quran Cures, Q U R A N Cures, you will find the YouTube channel in which. They will not only show you some of these catchings, he will tell you there are courses, training level 1, training level 2, training level 3. And he's not trying to sell you that. Like you see the commercials hey, on TV. Yeah. So you're being, uh, so you're being asked, uh, what's up with the hijab? What's up with the hijab? Yep. All right. I will tell you right now, there are three answers and to that. Was, wasn't wasn't uh, Islam... Uh, Pre-modern, uh, women weren't forced to wear uh, burkas and whatnot, were they? Forced? Right. Again, I'm going to say religi- re- religious extremism for the burqa, for one. Yeah, that's yeah. al-Qaeda. Yes. Uh, and okay. there are there are some uh, <laughs> who are an extremist who do actually wear it of their own free will. Now, there's different debates, and you're going to have to research yourself. A lot of people ask me, are you a Sunni? Are you a Shia? Are you a a Hanafi, a Salafi, Wahhabi, whatever? I'm a Muslim. The Quran says again, hold tight to the rope of God and be not divided. 
anybody who's trying to be a good person, I'll shake hands with, I'll break bread with. I don't care who you are. Uh, but the hijab is, some say it's obligatory, some say it's not. Uh, like, for example, I'm the only Muslim in my household. My wife dresses modestly, you know, and I don't require it of her. She dresses modestly. She just does. If someone else's wife doesn't, that's on them. Uh, you're just going to have to ask the individual Muslim or the individual Muslim household about that. But I can tell you three beliefs in which I know of. Uh, and the one is, is obviously when you see on TV, things like that, there's the people who do force it and that's wrong. Uh, there are people, you know, you have single Muslims who, uh, they wear it by themselves obligatory. But let me ask you this. You take that hijab, you put a nun beside them in the same room. How mm -hmm. is it that a nun is being devoted to God because her hair and her body's covered up, but a Muslim woman isn't being devoted to God? She's being oppressed. That's my answer. Yeah. Do we have, yeah. Any, do we have, do we have any more questions? Yeah. Uh, what exactly is Sharia law? Or is that uh, to me, Sharia law is uh, actually part of the extremism side too, isn't it? Yes and no. If it has came from the Quran itself, then no. If it is like these, uh, for example, and this really angers me the most, just like I said about how the Saudi Arabian government has ruined it, or you'll see some of these uh, Islamic speakers online on YouTube, for example. Some of them, you'll see them, they'll be dressed like... Uh, with Trump and the Ayatollah there and stuff like that, it looked like the axis of evil. It looked like something from a comic book. But the Ayatollah there should not be dressing in gold lion robes and anything to make him look fancy. Uh, because it was said about Muhammad that even when he was the absolute ruler of Mecca, he still slept on palm fibers and dirt on the ground. And they said, you know... You're ruling everything. You're basically the king around here now. How come you're not up on a bed? How come you're not, you know, memory foam and can raise the head of the bed and has a massager in the bed? You know, all these different, you know, anemones of that time, for example. I was just using terminology. And he says, it's simple. These other kings have been given what they've been given. And I've been given what I've been given. He was humble. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, if you were to go back in that era, in that time, and you were to go to Mecca, and you were to hear that Muhammad was in a certain part of Mecca, you enter that room, you're going to be looking around unless you know him by face. You're not going to know because he wasn't sitting up in the middle of the pe He wasn't sitting up on a throne with people serving him. He was in the middle of the crowd. He was with the people. And I'll put it this way. For those of you who know me, Corey, I know you haven't known me very long. Coop, you've known me for a while. Some of the listeners mm -hmm. uh, have known me for quite a while. Uh, Coop, I think I actually started talking to you before I even really knew Dave, to be honest. Uh, but I want you to think about my character and think about how you guys know me. And look at me as an example. If you think I would follow anything that is oppressive and that would hold another human down, you use me for that example. And everybody who knows me, I'm not perfect. I have a temper. I sin. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I say things I shouldn't say. Sometimes I do things I shouldn't do. We're all in that boat. But I can tell you, for most of my life, I have been someone who has been a voice for the voiceless and a protector of the weak. And I'm not afraid to tell other people where they need to go when they need to go. And uh, those of you in this fold and in this faith who aren't speaking out, you need to speak out. And whatever your religion is, you make it your strong suit, but you need to learn other people's. 
You need to know what they believe before you insult it. And that's with everybody. I will invite a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, pagan, whatever into my home and I will break bread with you and I will sit back and I will laugh and I will talk and I will cry and I will joke. Uh, Jesus himself even kept company with the whores. Mm -hmm. So people need to think about that. Um, I know we're running into the last few minutes. Is there a limit on the three hours or do we got a few minutes over time? Uh, No, we got to wrap it up. All right. Well, I'm going to say if there's any other questions, I want you to go, like I said, on Google earlier before Coop got cut off. And uh, I'll post the link in Forest Moon Paranormal. Um, All the listeners, this is my last broadcast on S4 until further notice, unless I ever get a Saturday night off. Uh, You might hear from me from time to time. I'll keep active in the community and the SOR community. And uh, if you have any questions regarding this, or if you do need a healer, you feel you need a healer, if you're just curious, you come to me and I will direct you to the right place. And if I have been in any error during this broadcast or any information that I've given, uh, may God accept my efforts and may my errors be forgiven. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all have a good night. All right. Thank you, Seth. Outstanding show. Uh, glad to have you uh, explain Islam as well as, as Jin, because uh, it, it's a very confused, uh, misunderstood belief system um, and very corrupted uh, view from our own government and, and whatnot. So, yeah, a uh, good clarification on it. Um, don't forget, folks. Next Saturday, we will continue as for uh, not Sunday nights, and it will be a roundtable with Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, Eric Themer from Spaced Out Radio, and trying to get Markham back in for a roundtable, as well as Corey and I. So, Corey, any last words? No, all I can say is thank you, everyone, for joining us, and all have a good night. All right, y'all have a good week. We'll see you next week.